everyone and welcome to Stan the Wine Man TV. I am your host, Stan Rutan, and this is the Blue Collar Wine Show where I help you spend your wine dollars wisely. And today I have with us Rick Sayre, are you head wine maker at Rodney Strong? I'm now emeritus. Emeritus. Yeah. Emeritus, yeah. So you are stepping into retirement I'm, and still I'm riding out. off into the sunset. <laughs> okay, well, you, I understand you started at Rodney Strong in 1979, and prior to that, you uh, worked at Simi. Prior to that, I was at Simi Winery. You, and, were a little, uh, you were a little younger then. I was sort of a reluctant winemaker. Um, reluctant winemaker? Yeah, I was 19. I didn't yeah. know what I wanted to do. Okay. So uh, I wanted to be a firefighter, work in the forestry, which I did for one year. There are a picture of me in my fire coat. And you know, you work in the forestry when the rains come and they don't need firefighters anymore. So I was looking for a job. There was a lumber mill north of town and I put an application in there next to the lumber mill was a little tasting room. It was a big wooden wine vat and it said help wanted. Long story short, guy came out, looked at me, had my pregnant wife with me. Uh, pregnant wives are always good to take on a job interview. <laughs> and they hired me the next day. And cool. I ended up working at Seeming Winery for 10 years. Really? Yeah. And you started off, of course, with schlep and grapes and everything. pressing and everything. Everything. Yeah. everything. Shoveling. I mean, I did landscaping too. Did you really? And I've got farming in my background. My my father. Uh, I was born on a farm in Michigan. Okay. And uh, my parents moved me to California when I was three. So, but we've always had a farm, a garden in our backyard. Right. So I've always had farming in my blood. So, and I think to be a good winemaker, you need to embrace that too, because that's that's part of the whole. Oh yeah. The whole thing. Viticulture is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you. D did you eventually make it up to head winemaker at Simi? Or did you just no um, assistant winemaker? Well, I was 19. I was a young right. kid. I was very uh, muscle bound, but uh, uh, I was the guy that did all the work. Yeah. And, but I had some chemistry in college, so I was doing some lab work gotcha. as well. And uh, my title, I was assistant winemaker and cellar master. Uh, the winemaker at that time was Bob Stemler. Okay. And uh, he liked the way I worked. I, my, uh, <clears throat> I've always been sort of a bossy person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was born in May, so I'm uh, a Taurus. Yeah. My wife says that I'm stubborn, and I said I, I you know, I'd like I'll to like say, say that, yeah. I said I'm, I'm <laughs> prefer to use the word directionally oriented. <laughs> I like that. Directionally oriented. Yeah. So anyway, I worked at Simi for ten years. Worked from the ground up. Did everything equipment and uh, when I was in high school I uh, was in the welding shop so when things broke I was down there welding and my dad was a carpenter so I've got that experience as well so it um, you can see that when I, I drove forklift right uh, back in the day and we didn't even have asphalt and driving a forklift unloading a uh, truckload of glass and gravel is is uh, really challenging. <laughs> so I, I'm just going to show this. So he's brought this book because he's doing a winemaker's dinner at a local restaurant here, Downriggers. So he brought his little book there. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm sure they can see it. So nice left in there. Yeah, our, our camera guy left. So so the, anyway, you now I, I I'm curious. So after ten years there, uh, did somebody seek you out from Rodney Strong? This gentleman. Okay. And I'd like to say, if I was Luke Skywalker, this was my Yoda. <laughs> and this gentleman is Andre Chelichev. Oh, yeah, of he course. He was the wine master of BV. Right. Well, he's, he's famous. He left BV in uh, late 72, early 73, and I was his first pupil because he started consulting at Seeming Winery. Gotcha. Right after he left BV. And so I worked uh, close to eight years with Andre Chelichev. And wow. uh, he inspired me. Uh, I was going to go back in the forestry, uh, but he inspired me to uh, be a winemaker. And I had to take um, a survey of everything that I wanted to do in life. And you know, I was not even 21 when I met him. And uh, the winemaking, the grape growing, and everything else encompassed everything that I really enjoyed doing. So I loved to cook. Um, 
I love to farm. I love uh, I love to run crews. I just uh, I just feel like I'm. Uh, that, You're that's what that. makes me excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. So, then how did you transition from see me with with this, Andre Andre to Rodney Strong? Well, see me. It was the renaissance of the wine industry back then. There, right. there weren't that many grape vines. It was just now, I mean, Robert Mugabe started in the late 60s. So this was really a time of new experiences. And um, so at 19, 10 years later, fast forward, I was 29. I was still the young kid. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I worked for two of the most famous women in the wine industry. The first woman graduate from University of Davis was Mary Ann Graff. Okay. And she just passed away about a month ago. And uh, she uh, she came in a few months, uh, well, a few months uh, after Andre Chelichev came on board. And we both worked for Andre. She was the winemaker. She was the chemist. That's what she was trained for. I was more of the cellar master. I was the get the job done. Right. Uh, boots on the ground out in the vineyard, something breaks, fix it, or whatever. Uh, and and so I was getting pretty good at that, but there was no opportunity for me to grow there. Uh, Marianne Graff left the winery and then they hired the number two woman, Zelma Long. And Zelma Long was working at Robert Mondavi and uh, left Robert Mondavi, I think October 1 was her first full-time experience at Simi, and that was like, oh, the harvest was almost over at that point. So I, I did the entire harvest of 79, pretty much. And uh, there was really not a lot of future. And the CEO at Simi Winery bought the grapes. And he would come to me and he says, why do these wines taste different every year? And I said, well, you're buying the grapes. And, you know, there's this little thing called terroir. Alexander Valley is going to taste different from Dry Creek, and then sure. found cheaper grapes up in Mendocino. And I said, you can't make the wines taste the same when you keep bouncing around. Yeah. I wish a lot of people understood that. Well, he was a commodities guy, so <laughs> he just he thought that was nonsense. And I just said, wait, look at the French. You know, this little thing called terroir, it's only been around a couple hundred yeah, years. Yeah. Um, so Rodney, Rodney approached me after the harvest of 79 and said, look, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I want you to come to work for me. And so I did. Okay. And he said, by the way, I've got 1,500 acres, some of the best vineyards in Sonoma County, and some of those vineyards we still, we still have. Okay. Which I did not have this opportunity of seeing. Right. So I knew if you're going to make wines that are going to be consistent, you have to have good vineyards. You have to have pride of ownership, and uh, so now, Rod, Rodney gave me the opportunity. How do you feel about vintage variation? I mean, you know, you're big into ter terroir. Do you do you like the wines to show a little bit of the vintage? Well, the vintage, um, I think it's. I know more, it's really consistent. It's more important in Europe yeah. because the vintages are so, you know, extreme. Right. And here, especially Burgundy. I looked at all the years that I've made wine since 1970, and I can say that only one out of nine, or what we call a difficult vintage, or we right. have to deal with wet weather or right. cold weather. And so we're fairly spoiled as far as uh, the wine making sure. around the world. But vintages are important. They're sort of a snapshot in time. Uh -huh. And yeah. you can taste if you have enough experience, you can taste what a vintage does to a wine. Was it cold? Had a little more higher acidity, maybe. Right. Uh, it was hot. There's a heat wave. The grapes have a tendency to get overripe, very jammy. Uh -huh. uh, so it changes the chemistry a little bit. Uh, crop loads. You try to. Those are things that you try to deal with, manipulate, get the correct crop load because we're always talking about balance now. Uh -huh. uh, I, I don't like to, to get. Sommeliers have a lot of uh, uh, what they call, well, dogma. Sure. Uh, okay, yeah. everybody knows Dry Farm makes better wines and this and that. And I'm like, no, no, it's a, a vine has to be balanced. Yeah. And I've seen years where there's too little a crop, you'd think you'd make great wines. And too little of a crop, the vines ripen, the grapes ripen so fast 
Right. That the sugar's got high, but the tannins never mature. The production of Rodney Strong today? Uh, altogether, it's just under a million cases. Yeah. But the, the largest part of that is what I call our everyday wines, our Sonoma counties, uh, which is Cabernet, Chardonnay, and Merlot. Right. And that's about three quarters of the entire thing. Right. And then we have another tier called our estates, the, the vineyards that we own. And then we have our reserves and single vineyards, which are really crafted. Well, we're talking 500 cases, 1,000 cases. Right. So and we have a little bit of everything going on. Oh, there you go. That's perfect. And in today's economy, it gives you stability because if, if um, you sell only in restaurants when the economy goes down, you're not selling much wine because people will mostly buy their wine in grocery stores. Yeah. So you have to have a presence in the grocery store and the restaurants. Yes. And that gives you financial stability. I mean, being a farmer is bad enough as it is, but you have to have some stability sure. in, in your sales. Sure. So that, that helps us you know, pay the bills and cash flow is important. And you can still concentrate on these handcrafted, very small, unique plots. And, and that's what we're focusing on. That's awesome. Yeah, I think uh, I was always, uh, one of the questions that I'm not going to ask you because it probably doesn't fit into the realm of where you've grown up in the wine world, but a lot of these smaller wineries, you know, the, the guy's a winemaker, he owns a winery, and I always ask him how you uh, deal with artistic expression versus selling the wine, you know, because I've seen some winemakers yeah. start a winery and really struggle because they're trying to put out this wine that, well, they really love it, but it doesn't have public appeal at all. Right, right. And uh, that's basically what you're saying. You have these other crafted wines, but you yeah. have to have the wines that bring in the dough. There's, you know, and winemakers are like chefs. Everybody has a different philosophy oh, yeah. of what they want to do and what their consumer wants. And I think a lot of, some of the winemakers are so esoteric. So I don't care what the consumer wants. This is, if they like exactly. my wine, I'm going to make it the way I want. Yeah. And uh, I have a little different, broader version of that. I mean, I have wines that I know that I like, but I have friends who like uh, some of these wines. Like uh, I used to call them over-extracted, big, heavy, rich, super high like alcohol. The, the, the uh, Barossa Valley Shirazes. Yeah. And I've learned a long time ago: there's no right, there's no wrong in the wine business. It's drink what you like. Everybody is different. And I even know some winemakers like a certain amount of vinegar in their wines. wines. Yeah, yeah, particularly Pinot Noirs, or when you get into these uh, high alcohol Zinfandels, long fermentations, they'll generate yeah. acetic acid. No, I've started like I, every month I have a what I call a pick of a month in the store, and I stack it. And my criteria for these uh, guys is eighty percent of the people have to like it. Yeah. Because I'm not going to try and put a pick of the month out there. Yeah. You know, only 40% of the people are going to enjoy are going to enjoy it. Yeah. So it's the same, I think, with a winemaker or somebody like you who's handled these big volumes of wine. You have to recognize it. You have to put out wine there that 80% of the people are going to like. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to make any money. You're not going to be successful. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so we have a rosé here. So you have how many winemakers are working at Rodney Strong now? Well, um, two. I hired, uh, and I'm, I'm really proud of my young winemakers, and okay. I'm kind of following in the footsteps of my mentor, Andre okay. Chelichev, yeah. so. That's a, that's a good mentor to have. The uh, Greg Morthel started with us in 2005. Okay. Uh, he was directing our laboratory. He is very scientific. I used to, I would call him my first officer, Spock. Okay. He's just so <laughs> dialed in. Yeah. and uh, incredible winemaker. He's making the Chardonnays and the Pinot Noirs. He's also the winemaker for Davis Bynum. Oh, gotcha. And then in 2010, I hired Justin Seidenfeld. Uh, he had worked at uh, Robert Madavi, Oakville. Okay. And before that, he worked at Iron Horse, and uh, he worked for a good friend of mine, Dave Munsgaard. And I had called up Dave, and he says, you know, Justin's the type of guy I would like to have if I was going to retire. I said, well, that's kind of what I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he is uh, 
extremely brilliant. Um, I, I'm teaching them to be a little more patient, though. I'm more patient than I am. <laughs> they work good together. Yeah. They do. But this rosé is... Uh, 2000, okay, I'm going to say this is a 2018 Rodney Straub Vineyards Rosé of Pinot Noir, Russian River Valley, Sonoma County. Yes. And what does this run, basically, price-wise? Well, at the uh, at the winery, the full retail price is just under $25. Okay. But so, probably can, like nineteen ninety nine dollars in a store? Probably. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. And I'm excited this is really it. interesting because right now Pinot Noir is the most expensive grape in Sonoma County. Is it really? It was. Uh, there's a shortage. I think the market's starting to loosen up a little bit now. Um, but um, there been, there's been, I don't know, I buy grapes, so there's been a lot of competition in buying grapes. So the spot market for this right now, if you can find grapes, would be somewhere around 3500 to $4,000 a ton. Wow. That's, yeah. So. Now, the beauty about this is you don't have to age it in $1,000 French oak barrels. Exactly. <laughs> and it's a quick turn. This, yeah. was, this was fermented Do you use in, in septem September. Uh, no, no, we only a tiny, tiny bit. We do, this is a deliberate rosé. It's okay. not a byproduct gotcha. of making a red Pinot Noir. We target the grapes. We start picking at about 20 and a half bricks. Right, okay. And we might finish picking at 21 and a half. So most of us right there, um, 20.5 to 21. And I like to describe this wine as champagne or in, in the U.S. we call it sparkling wine. Yeah, look at the color on this guy. Is it with real salmon, light yeah. salmon color? So how long do you leave it on the skins? Uh, probably about six to eight hours. Six to eight hours? Yeah. Now that, and we have to be flexible because we, we like to pick the fruit at night when it's cold. If you had fruit coming in, was picked late morning or early afternoon, the warmer it is, the quicker it extracts the color from the skins. So Okay, so I get you. Main thing is to get it at the winery early. Uh, we put a lot of it whole cluster, don't even distem it, put it in the press, and we'll let it sit there for three to six hours. And sometimes we'll put a little bit of dry ice, mix it in with the grapes, gotcha. and that helps cool it down. That also starts a little carbonic maceration. Not sure. a lot, but yeah. and that really helps with the color a little bit. Interesting. And then um, you press it very slowly, and then typically, uh, the heavier press gets to be very dark, so you have to have a comfort level. How much? Where's the cutoff? So you need to, to watch the flow, the juice coming out of the press. When it gets too dark, you take that heavy press fraction, put that in a separate tank, keep it separate. You can always clean it up and add back a little bit more to dial in the color. But gotcha. If you put it in all at once, then you can't. It's hard to take the color out. Plus. So it's better to keep that separate. And uh, with the whole cluster presses we have now, they're so gentle. They're, they're pressing, they're squeezing the juice out of the grapes at less than uh, 1.5 atmospheres, which would be somewhere around 20, 25 pounds per square inch. Oh, yeah. The these are bladder presses, correct? Or well, membrane presses. Membrane. Stainless steel membrane presses. Okay. Uh, where a bladder is more of a tube. Than right. In yeah, the center. Gotcha. Uh, the presses I had to deal with uh, when I first started, some of them were pressure was up to two, three hundred pounds per square inch. So there was a lot of extraction and mechanical grinding of the fruit. So the, the type of press is really important. Yeah, I bet. Uh, what do you think about the kind of the resurgence of the basket press? I love basket presses, but if you're going to make wine on a large scale, uh, those are very oh, slow. Yeah. Do you use them at all? No. Okay. We have, well, I have one we make a, a we have a port production that we make uh, like a couple hundred cases. Sure. So it's, when you make it, you yeah. have to have a toy to do that. Sure, right? yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But I, I prefer the, the larger tank presses. They're more efficient. And, uh, well, yeah, especially when you're producing what you guys produce. Yeah. I know uh, when I went to Portugal, uh, we went to a winery there that used a lot of basket presses. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this is a really elegant Pinot Noir rosé. It uh, initially I got a little bubble gum on the nose, which it happens sometimes, when, especially when they first come out. Mm -hmm. But it goes away pretty easily. It doesn't. It's not on the palate at all. Yeah. Uh, it's got really nice, real uh, 
light, elegant strawberry and cherry notes. And maybe a hint of watermelon. Yeah. Yeah. This is our second year where we've been selling this rosé on a national market. We've been making it for five years, selling it through the tasting okay. room. And it's one of our popular wines for our summer concert series at the winery. And on, oh, okay. on a hot day, it's really refreshing. Oh, yeah. No, it's very good. It's good. Yeah. As, I like the acid in it. Yeah. It, it really pops on the backside. Yeah. The acidity. So that's, I, I think when you're talking rosé, a lot of people like that acidity to come through. Um, and I've noticed some uh, Pinot Noirs out of rosés out of Oregon, sometimes they lack a little bit of acidity, so you don't, it gets a little bit funky on the finish, which can have a little Pinot Noir sometimes. Yeah, and uh, when you do the Sangue, you lose a lot of the acidity because you're harvesting the grapes riper to make a, a red Pinot Noir. Gotcha. So, oh yeah, well that makes sense. I like the dedicated rosé thing. So, I know my audience knows this, but Sanya is, it means basically bleed in French. So that they bleed off a little bit of the juice. They save the rest of the grapes for production of the main grape. Like in this case, if you use Sanya and Pinot Noir Rosé, you would bleed off some of the juice, and the rest of the Pinot Noir fruit would go into the red wine. Here, as, he's, as Rick is saying, they devote the grapes to Rosé. So, yeah. yeah. And typically, we're picking them to two to three weeks before that's a, we pick that's the red. Pinot Noir. I like it. Yeah. A lot. Okay, so this is a, I was introduced to this uh, about uh, a year ago? Yes. How long have you been producing the upshot? This is the second vintage. Okay, so yeah. I got in on ground floor. Yeah. And this this wine is one that we've, you know. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not okay. going to rinse because we just had a really light rosé, so. Is that okay with you? That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> I like a used glass. Yeah, so here we got the 2016 yeah. Upshot Red Wine Blend. 37% Zin, 30% Malbec, 27% Merlot, 3% Petit Verdot, and 3% Riesling. Yeah. Do you like that label? It is. What's, it's, what's it's sort of a Mayan calendar. It's a text sheet okay. on the label. It says everything about the wine. Now this was in about 24 bucks, I think, right? Does that sound right to you? Yeah. I think I sell it for that at the store. That's and that's full retail. Yeah. Yes. And this is a real techie wine. It, uh, it's all about the blend. And uh, we use a lot of different varieties. And you notice the last component was Riesling. Yeah, that's interesting. That really just popped the spice on this. And wow. We tried a lot of different things. and. Uh, we tried Muscat, and Muscat was a little bit too heavy, and the Riesling just lifted it enough. And uh, Justin played around with this in the laboratory for about two weeks before he finally decided on the blend. And then said, here, what do you think? I said, wow, I think you hit the, hit the mark. Did you like the blending process? Was that fun for you? Uh, we do blending on, on uh, our, our Meritage, our Symmetry. It's, it's a huge thing for us, and there's five different components going into that. Each year it's a little bit different. There's, there's no formula, but uh, this is a stylistic, it's more fruit driven with the Zinfandel and the gotcha. Malbec. Do you like that process though? I mean, do you like to, did you like to get in there and start I, I turning do, the dials? But I've, been, I've been slowly giving that up. Well, I'm sure you have, but did, yeah. was that one of the, what I'd say, the more interesting times when you were younger and you were blending wines? Did you? really get into that or did it, was it uh, not your favorite part? Yes and no. It uh, The more people you get in the room, the more challenging it is. Yeah, I can see that. So You try to keep it down? You, tr you try to, well, yeah, but you, it, it, it embraces the teamwork, but then you kind of lose some of the individu individuality of it. Right. But everybody is given the opportunity to make their own personal blend and then we'll put it in a brown paper bag oh, that's taste, a, taste that that's a good idea and taste that against the um, the team blend because everybody is very proud and they want their blend to sure win. sure and yet when you taste them blind it reveals everything all cards are on the table 
you taste it blind, you don't know who did what or oh, that's, what. That's a you very just cool. Select the that's best very one. cool. That's very that, cool. I like that a lot. And, and, and sometimes, you know, you get a little humble pie. You go, know, like, okay, well, my blend didn't win. <laughs> But so here we have this is Zinfandel base, a little juicier. But you know what yeah. I like about the nose on this, and I remember it now when this was presented to me. I get a lot of tobacco. It, it reminds me of a rose, uh, rose flavored tobacco on the nose, which is pretty cool. There's a lot of things going on in here. A little bit of bark. The Zinfandel gives you that um, blackberry quality. Um, the Malbec gives you a little bit of black walnut, blueberries. And yeah. We finally call Malbec blueberry motor oil. <laughs> so it's really unctuous. I like that. Especially out of California. Yeah. And then the Petit Verdot uh, definitely gives it some back foam. Um, the Riesling pops the fruit. So uh, oh, that's that's very good. Yeah. Good There's balance. Uh, good integration of fruit, tannins, and acidity. There's a little spiciness on the back side of this one. Right. And a little white pepper, sort of black pepper uh -huh. going on. Um, yeah, I, I fell in love with this one the first time I tried it. And uh, yeah, we sell a fair amount of it. I mean, the blend category is so competitive. Yes. I mean, there's so many different blends. I mean, it's probably next to Chardonnay my biggest section in the store. Really? Chardonnay is huge. I mean, we just can't. Yeah. It's still the number one selling wine in the yeah. United States. Um, well, we sell a lot of Rodney Strong Chardonnay. You guys have got that dialed in for sure. Um, but this, and for those of you, if you come into Kings, not all my guys live on the island, but look for that one. Uh, because don't let the Zim throw you off. It's got great balance. I mean, you know, some people don't like Zinfandel, but this does not taste like a Zinfandel. It has the juiciness of a zinc, but it has all those other components. Very complex. Really. Yeah. I like it. Very good. good. Thank yeah. You. Well, there you go. Rick Sayre, soon to be retired <laughs> from Rodney Strong. Uh, thanks, Rick, for right. taking a little bit of time and talking about your your career and what you've done. And thanks for sharing your wines. Okay. All right. You keep watching, and I'll keep helping you spend your wine dollars wisely.